Well, loving Jesus is a way that you and I develop resiliency in our following Jesus. And then to love him well uh, requires us sometimes cleaning out some religious or secular clutter. And here's one example that I just want to give you right now. For you who are here or those of you who are at home. If you're thinking like right now, like, okay, we're in church and we're going to talk about church things. And then when I go out and I listen to the radio or I'm at school and university or I'm doing my life, then we're talking about real life things. I'm telling you, you have an issue. We're talking about real life things right here from a Christ-centered perspective that should touch our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So we don't just talk about church things in church. We talk about Jesus things that touches all things. Different. And so today we are going to begin and we're going to end with looking at uh, a specific trust. Specifically, I think as it is with every Sunday, includes this Sunday, but some Sundays a little bit more. But how you see God determines whether or not you will trust God. And there are many of you who have trusted God on the salvation side, but there's other areas of your life where you're not so trustworthy. So there's some places where we can be totally open-handed with God, and there's other places that we can be varying degrees of close-handed to like just resident, like just hesitant, I should say, excuse me. And so when it comes to love, we, week one was that God always goes first. Last week, when it took, like, looks like loving Jesus, Jesus, we love God with our all, which must be above and before any other love, which is difficult for every single one of us. And lastly, this week we're going to look at how Jesus uses kingly language to articulate to us plainly what us loving God actually looks like. Every single one of us, we don't all have different personalities. There are different personality groupings in here. But here's the truth. As a follower of Christ, your expression of worship will come through the personality that God has given you. It could be more emotive or it can be more intellectual. It can be more outwardly expressive or inwardly expressed. This isn't the issue. The personality, your personality is not the issue. It is your hunger for the presence of God that is more important than your personality. It is the orientation of your soul towards your heavenly Father that matters. Not how loud you shout, how engaged your heart is. This is what matters. It's again, it's presence driven. And here's what Jesus said, regardless of personality. If, which is big, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So if you love me, you will keep my commandments commandments. This is what Jesus said. Notice he didn't say, if you love me, you will feel emotive all the time towards me. You will always feel an ush and a gush and a go towards God. He didn't say that. He said, if you love me, you're going to keep all my commandments. Now, I can imagine that some of you are like a little more, you will keep my commandments. Sorry, I put the word all, it shouldn't have been there. You'll keep my commandments. Now, how many of you have a cell phone? Can I see your hands, please? Some of us struggle, like, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But then every time that bings, bops, or buzzes, our heart flutters and moves towards it. Anybody here ever in a conversation with someone? You're engaged in a conversation, and their phone buzzes, and they pick up their phone in the middle of a conversation with you, like a third person just walked right in. But it's amazing because these things that we have in our pockets, they're incredibly tools, they're incredible tools, but they are really actually truly, truly harsh masters. And they can pull our attention and they can pull our affection. Like I have been reading things on social media where nothing happened to me, but all of a sudden I'm mad. <laughs> and then everybody within my sphere of influence is going to experience something that never happened to me. I just read about it. It's an incredible thing. Oftentimes we bristle with like... Psh, I would never, like, follow all your commands. How is that love? But we love our phones and we follow all of its notifications without even thinking about it. So is it that far stretched to think in these terms and ways? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And Jesus says this as he knows from experience that we're going to be tempted in one of two ways. Puberty. We can be so moved by compassion. Some of you, your temptation is you will be so moved with compassion for the real brokenness in people's lives that you are going to be tempted to change what Jesus said because it offends you or it offends them. You're going to be tempted to change it 
so that you can appear more loving. And when you do it, it is a rejection of Jesus, not as Savior, but as King. This is kingly language. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So the question becomes, do I trust him? Is he a good king? This is the question. And so some of us, and here's the challenge. If you and I become just identical to the world, then we offer nothing, nothing different to the world. In other words, we cannot be a part of a solution if we become equally a part of the problem. And this is the temptation that some of us will experience. Others of us will not experience this. You will experience something different. Your religion will become so rigid that you will offer people only truth without grace or love. You will be judgmental of others who struggle in a way that you do not struggle nor ever have struggled, which comes out as harsh and maybe not as the Father loved. And Jesus didn't fall prey to either of these things. He was fully truth and fully gracious. Not a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. He was both fully. And Jesus was incarnational, meaning he knew how to be in something but not of it. He knew how to be around sinners and tax collectors and not become a sinner himself. He was incarnational in this beautiful way. And this is what he wants for you and for, I, and for me. And so Jesus knows this temptation. And so he went first to show us that keeping God's commands and loving people well is something we can actually do. But we need two things. One is something that we do in our own strength. Or I should say like we do by doing, not even in our own strength, scratch that. The one is something that we do. The other is a relationship that we have with someone who their strength enables us to do not only what we want to do, but the very things that we don't want to do. This is what we want to talk about, how we love God. How do we absolutely keep his commandments? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest, this is Jesus, who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Oh, what a gracious Savior. So how did Jesus live well in the tension of loving people? Because he loved people extraordinarily well, but also keeping the Father's commandments. Well, two ways, two ways that we want to look at today. In life, when you and I look at spiritual disciplines, there are two sides to spiritual disciplines. There are spiritual dis disciplines of engagement, things that you do by doing. Coming to church is a spiritual discipline. Reading your Bible is something you do. It's a spiritual discipline. Posturing yourself for prayer is something you do. It's a spiritual discipline. Giving is a spiritual discipline that you and I engage in. All of these things are you, you do something by actually doing something. These are one side of spiritual disciplines. But there's another side of spiritual disciplines called abstinence gifts. And these are things that you do by not doing certain things. Fasting. How many of you love fasting? Look at that. All the hands went right up. Fasting is something that you do by not doing something. Sabbath, rest, is something that you and I do by not doing something. Not saying stuff doesn't have to get done, but we prioritize the Lord in a moment saying, God, I'm going to rest today and trust that I don't have to get everything done in my life. When I rest, I trust that you are still at work. Silence. Oh, oh, some people today, you need, you need the spiritual discipline of shh. No, silence. Not every thought in your head needs to be shared out loud. Not everything you feel needs to be posted online. In Jesus' name. Silence and solitude are things that you do, but sometimes it's important to withdraw from other people, not because they're horrible people, though some are. But you withdraw from it. That was a joke. You withdraw from people from this place so that you can kind of get your heart reset with the Lord. You know, there was a season of my life into my early 40s where if I'm going to be caught or tempted in an area, it's usually going to show up in some form, way, shape of not enoughness, which my, te my, my temptation is to solve it on my own. And so to begin to set me free... I began to engage a spiritual discipline called silence. So not daily, but I would say at least five to six days out of the week, 
I spend at minimum now two to four minutes a day, which is a lot for me. Some of you instantly judge it like, "Mm." I spend two to four minutes a day on either end because four minutes together, I go crazy. Two minutes in the beginning of my day, two minutes at the end where I sit in silence. You say, well, isn't that a waste of time? Are you doing nothing? No, 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 no. I sit in silence and I remind myself, Lord, I don't have to do everything. I have to surrender to you who are at work in all things. I am not the Savior. I am not the Lord of my life. I'm not the leader of my life. I am actually not in charge and it's not my job to fix everything. So Father, I am just gonna rest and I'm not doing nothing. I'm intentionally resting in your presence as just your son. And I'll tell you what, when I first began that practice, you know what happened in my life? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. We overestimate what God can do in a moment, and we underestimate what God can do in years. And sometimes God will supernaturally set you free of something, and it'll just be instantaneous. God is a miracle-working God, and everybody said? But he's also Jehovah Rapha, and he's also our healer, and sometimes he wants to take us on a long journey to show us what he could do in an instant over time because we are learning something about him and about us and about others along the way. And sometimes he chooses instant, and sometimes he chooses process. He gets to choose. I just get to surrender to whatever he desires to do. So we overestimate sometimes what God can do in a moment, and we underestimate what he can do in a decade. Oh, man, engage. So spiritual disciplines. So first, we can't and we shouldn't separate discipline from discipleship. So some of us are caught in our lives right now because we're not engaging spiritual disciplines that we need to engage. Some of us, the way our, the why our lives are the way they are, why our attitudes are the way they are, is we are being formed by things that are not necessarily Christ-centered. Every single one of us have disciplines. You do not have to work to develop disciplines. Every single one of you have a rule of life. There's a way that you live your life. The question you have to ask yourself is, the one that I have making me more like Jesus? Here's a question I no longer have any interest in asking. How long have you been following Jesus? I don't care. Here's a deeper question and a better question. How surrendered are you in your following of Jesus? <laughs> because you can follow Jesus for two years and grow exponentially. You can follow Jesus for 20 years and grow this much. How surrendered are you in your following Jesus? This is what matters in our hearts and in our lives. So every single one of us have a rule of life. Every single one of us have things that we do every single day that we don't have to think about. They're disciplines in our lives. The question is, am what am I doing? Am what am I engaged in? Is it helping me to be more like Jesus, left like Jesus? Is it helping me love people like Jesus or less like Jesus? When you look at Jesus, he did extraordinary things. Like at the height of ministry success, he would wander away or a town would be begging him to stay and he would say, I'm not gonna stay. I've gotta do what the Father says to do and he would move onwards. In other words, Jesus had this surrendered relationship with the Father where every single day he had one thing on his calendar. Lord, at the end of my day, whatever it has, whether I'm eating and drinking with sinners, whether I'm healing someone over here, whether I'm teaching here or getting chased out by Pharisees here, Father, I want to put my head on the pillow and say, did my life give you honor today? And I'm going to orient my life around hearing your voice, voice recognition, whose voice orients your life. Whose voice orients your life? And if you're like me, I got a lot of voices. And by the way, the world is real loud, real noisy. Have you read the data of how much information we have actually produced as a society in the last decade? Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Information is quite interesting. We said it last week. It's something that gets inside of you, information. It gets in and begins to form you. So which voice? And so for Jesus, he had these spiritual disciplines where you see that he would fast and he would pray. People say things like this, really foolish things. You don't have to go to church to be like a, you don't, you don't, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No, but you do if you want to be like Jesus. Jesus was in the Sabbath in the synagogue every week. To be like Jesus, you have to do what Jesus did. Live like Jesus lived in the real world, not the Christian world, the real world. How many of you know that the world, the real world needs followers of Christ who have spiritual disciplines that when you show up to work, it's not whether you spent time with Bill Carroll on CFRA that matters, it's have you spent time with Jesus 
Because if you only spend time with Bill Carroll, you're going to show up maybe a little bit angry to the, I got nothing against Bill Carroll. I don't know why he's coming out right now. I don't, I don't even listen to CFRA or whatever podcast. you. Some of you are like, what's radio? I don't know what that is. <laughs> well, listen, children, there's a dial on your, on your, in your, there's not a dial. It's a touch button. What am I even talking about? There's no dial in the car anymore. Like, I wanted to use an example here of the church. Like, I wanted to come and, like, lay the keys down. And then I realized, there's no more keys. It's just a piece of plastic. It wouldn't have made any sense. You have key fobs now that open doors is all I'm saying. So we shouldn't separate discipline from discipleship. And like all other forms of discipline, sometimes to be who we most desire to be, we need to daily do things that we don't want to do. I'll give you an example. I want to take my family on a vacation. And I also want to eat out every single night. I want to be in shape <laughs> by doing nothing. <laughs> I don't mean a little bit. I mean like a lot. I want to eat what I want. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I want to eat what I want and everyone said... Okay, all gluttons, let's go. It's prayer. Let's go and see again. I want to eat whatever I want, and I want my pant size to say the same. I am not bound by anything. Okay? I'm not bound by anything, we say. The number on your pant size shows us your affection towards things that don't matter. I mean, they do matter in one sense. But like, you know, when I, sometimes when I put on my size 33 pants, I put on a pair of size 33 pants. You know what they had the nerve to do? They had the nerve to squish everything on the side. <laughs> the nerve of those pants. Secondly, you know what those pants had the nerve, the nerve to do? Affect my security in myself. <laughs> and the solution is, just go get the pants that say 35. <laughs> but all of a sudden I feel like, but I'm not a 35, I'm a 33. And the data is saying, you're 36. <laughs> I'm even underselling it right now. That's how deep this goes. Here's all I'm saying by that silly example. The Apostle Paul in Romans said, why do I do what I don't want to do and the very things that I want to do, I, I don't do? Uh, as human beings, we all wrestle with discipline. And so, you know what? Spiritual disciplines are so important. But I tell you what, they're not the Savior. To be like Jesus, you cannot do it through discipline alone. And I am not demeaning spiritual disciplines. They're essential. They are just not God. The study of theology is good, but theology in and of itself is not God. It's the study of God, not God. Here's what Jesus said. Oh, phone. <laughs> and what was this notification, perhaps? So we, we can't, nor should we separate disciplines from discipleship. I'm not saying that. But when it comes to being like Jesus, let's listen to what Jesus had to say himself. He said in John 14, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, capital H, to be with you forever. So, loved ones, if discipline was enough, we would not need the Holy Spirit. You know what I think is beautiful from Jesus and also like a bit of like foreshadowing? It's exactly what we read. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Helper, <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. These last five words. <laughs> to be with you forever. How encouraging is that? Lord, how long am I going to need help? F forever. <laughs> Until I achieve maturity in my spiritual disciplines, no, 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 no. Even if you have maturity in your disciplines, you still need the helper. You still need the Holy Spirit. You still need a sub, someone dwelling on the inside of you that is a source that is greater than you. How many of you have one person in your life 
that helps you grow in grace. Can I see your hands, please? Somebody that when you see them, you go, they don't even deserve to be sucking the same air I'm sucking right now. When you're out at a store and you see them, you... I'm just gonna I'm just gonna begin to come down here to pray. Oh heavenly Father, thou art good, <laughs> and thou art wise. You liar, get off your feet. <laughs> you know the funny thing when we ever do an example like that is you thought of someone, and I promise you, somebody thought of you, <laughs> and no one thought of me. <laughs> oh, is that the guy in the back? I'm thinking of you right now. You're all standing between me and lunch. Hurry up, Boucher. I hear you. I received that feedback. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. If discipline was enough to love that person well, if you could get there through discipline alone, you don't need the Holy Spirit. But you know what? When the Holy Spirit is present, even some people who caused you to grow in grace so much, did you know that if you continue inch by inch to surrender, it's not just that you will tolerate them. He will give you a supernatural love for them that no discipline can ever do. The Holy Spirit is not in the business of mere information. The Holy Spirit is in the business of transformation, making you and I into being whom we could never be without him in our hearts and in our lives. Jesus knew that for each of us, life is a contested space, means there are real, is a real devil, demons, darkness, deceptions, and then mixed into that is just all of our earthly desires. Some of them are good, some of them are not good, but it all gets mixed into there. And all are active for which our discipline is important, but it is not strong enough on its own. Discipline is something you do. The Holy Spirit is God dwelling on the inside of you. And at this moment, I want you to pay close attention to the intentional contrast that Jesus is about to make in John chapter 14, verse 17. He says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Pause. It is why if you think we're walking in and we're talking about church things and out there is like real life things, this is a problem because sometimes out there is plenty of small T truths but not capital T truth. Truth is a someone. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That is not broad. That is narrow. And so here's what, the, here's what Jesus says. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. Watch what Jesus is saying. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. In a sense, Jesus is telling his disciples, that I'm God, and the very way that I'm dwelling with you is the identical way that the Holy Spirit, come Acts 2, is going to dwell in you. Please hear me again. The Son honors the Father, and the Son honors the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, the Spirit honors the Son who honors the Father. You cannot divide Old Testament God from New Testament Jesus. Same. Same. Different culture, different time, progressive understanding of grace. Same God. Same truth. Practically speaking, the Holy Spirit, it walks with us and watches over us and works through us. So disciplines are truly vital. They are. But if disciplines were enough, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the moment you gave your life to Jesus, all of your disciplines were not transformed? There are people who don't know Jesus who are way more disciplined than I am in every area of their heart and life. Disciplines and spiritual disciplines are essential, but here's the thing. That little word spiritual in front of disciplines is not just, it's not just an adjective. It changes the very definition of what we're talking about. And I don't even know properly if that's an adjective or an adverb. I'm just going to pretend like I knew what I was talking about, and some of you nod along. And those of your English teachers are like, no, it wasn't either. I don't know. We're just going to keep moving. I am a C-plus student doing my best, giving my all. We don't worship disciplines, services, technology, even theology. These are all good things. 
But all, in, all things in and of themselves are not enough. They are not God. You know, the pandemic, how many know the pandemic was a hard season? It really was. It was a real difficult season. But you know what it taught us? Like we as a church love having certain things. But you can take away every light and every screen and every piece of technology. You can take away all of it. If all of it broke next Sunday, we as the church can gather. I can project my voice louder than a microphone, and all of our voices together could sing. And you know what? It is a sweet-smelling incense to the Lord. Our hope, our faith, our confidence is not in our technology. It is in the transforming work of the Holy Spirit, plus absolutely nothing. And what the pandemic did is not just the work of the enemy or the work of, you know, bad government, good government, whatever you want to talk about. No, 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 no. It was also God pruning His church so that our dependence would be on nothing but him. How fun was that season? (laughs) Not fun, but absolutely necessary, vital. This isn't our church, it's Jesus's church. And sometimes in love, Jesus corrects and course corrects his church if we're going to get off. I don't know if you know, but there have been these beautiful outpouring in Kentucky at a university where a chapel service that began like a couple of weeks ago is still continuing today. You know what our prayer to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit is? More, Lord, more. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You are more than welcome. We invite you into every single heart and every single life. I believe with every fiber of my being that on every country of the world, in every continent of the world, there are followers of Jesus who are like seeds that the Holy Spirit has sown intentionally, who's beginning to water intentionally. You know what's extraordinary about this move of God on a university campus is there's no one leading it. Well, well, who's the preacher? It's just students coming together, worshiping, praying, confessing, repenting. It is this extraordinary thing. When I look at the next generation, I started last Sunday talking about statistics of the next generation. When we begin to see God pour out at the next generation, whether it's at a retreat or whether it's a university, come on, every one of us who's in the next generation above them, our only prayer should be more, 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 more. Not criticizing it, not critiquing it, not putting it down, not this, not that, more, more. It doesn't mean it doesn't have to be led. It doesn't have to be controlled. Ah, loved ones, we have had way too much much control in church. It's okay to let the Holy Spirit move a little bit more. But when the Holy Spirit does, it's not just that we're getting, if it's weird, let's call it the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that. Sometimes it's just weird because you're weird. Sometimes it's weird because I'm weird. Just because it's weird doesn't mean it's the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit shows up. It says in John chapter 14, verses 25, 26, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you here this day. The Holy Spirit is in us and teaches us all things and brings to our remembrance all things that Jesus has said to us. Pastor Jack Hayford said, the Holy Spirit never tells us about himself. He comes to glorify Jesus Helping us to see Jesus more, to understand Jesus better, and to respond to Jesus more obediently, and to love Jesus with a different heart, a deeper heart commitment. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. He comes to bring direction. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's our refuge in the midst of the storm. The Holy Spirit is our conqueror, not of other people, but of our own flesh. The Holy Spirit comes as rain, bringing refreshing and restoration. The Holy Spirit comes as wind, depicting God's discernment and guidance. And hold that for 10 seconds and let me just say, when you posture yourselves in spiritual disciplines, whether it's reading your Bible, whether it's praying, whether it's engaging your whole heart, or whether it's on this side of fasting or solitude, all you're doing is getting your sail sail up because you never know where the wind's going to blow. But I promise you as followers of Jesus, if you're stuck to the dock, tied to the dock with your sail, down, the Holy Spirit will blow right by you and it won't change your life at all. But your disciplines posture you to get your sail up so wherever God begins to move, you begin to move where God is beginning to move you. 
Why do you spend time with Jesus in the morning or at night? It's so that during the day your sail is up and it may be to your manager or it may be your coworker, or maybe you send a word of encouragement or a text and you may not know when it happens eternally. One of the favorite things that I'm looking forward to spending time with Jesus is when you did this, when you did this, when you did this, when you sowed that seed, when you sowed that seed and you thought nothing of it. Here's what I did with that. Let me show you from the grand scheme of what your faithfulness that you thought meant nothing actually mattered. No, you're not the Savior, but I was working in you there, and I was working in them there, and there they were there, and they had no idea. They thought they were living life, but God was working here. God's working here. God's working here. God's working here. God's working here. here. And all of a sudden, everything comes together for good. Those who love God. The Holy Spirit comes as a river, channeling in us places where the refreshing living water needs to flow or flow again. The Holy Spirit comes as oil. Prophet, priests, and kings all required oil of anointing to do what they were called to do and carry what they're called to steward. The Holy Spirit comes as wine, and Jesus describes this as sometimes we need new work of God happening in us, not old, something new. The Holy Spirit comes as fire to burn in or to burn out or to shape us rather than having us take the shape of the world, the Holy Spirit comes as a dove, this gentle symbol of peace, not as the world gives, but only as Jesus gives. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and gifts us, spiritually gifts us to serve a lost and broken world. The Holy Spirit teaches us and reminds us of all the things that Jesus said that are true, not some of the things, not the things that you agree with or I agree with, all of the things all of the things, and the Holy Spirit fills us initially and then again and again as we pour out to overflowing. So no, we can't and shouldn't separate spiritual disciplines from discipleship, but we should never elevate them to the same level of the Holy Spirit. We should never elevate our discipline as greater than the Holy Spirit of of God. So how do we receive the Holy Spirit? Acts 2, 38, 8 to 17. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Why repentance first? Because before there, needs to be, before there can be a filling, there needs to be some emptying. Why pruning? Because before you can bloom more beautifully, sometimes things need to be taken away. And here's what I know. There have been some in your air in your life who had a place of authority, and their authority may have been abusive or unhealthy. And so it's hard for you to trust when someone's going to take something away that it's from love and not just for to serve them or their benefit. But I can promise you that if your heavenly Father desires to take something from your life, it is only to fill you with more of His precious Holy Spirit. Your heavenly Father is not like any of those abusive places and or people of authority that you had in your life. He is a good father who knows how to give good gifts to his children. We may not always be trustworthy, but he is. And so our prayer on this Sunday is three words. Holy Spirit, come. Amen.